And at this point, I'm going to ask Brian Coburn, our manager of our Women's History and Resource Center, to come up and introduce our second speaker for the day. Thank you, Babs. Thank you, Teresa. I'm personally, I'm a Samoa guy, so I <laughs> know they're back there. I, I don't know. Yeah. All right. So um, I would like to introduce John. Join uh, as president and C CEO of the National Women's History Museum. Uh, Joan Bradley Wages uh, leads the 501c nonprofit organization dedicated to educating the general public and about the diverse historic contributions of women and raising awareness about the critical need for a National Women's History Museum in our nation's capital. As one of uh, NWHM's founding board members, Joan has been a passionate and tireless champion of this effort for nearly 20 years. In addition to overseeing the museum's development, programming, events, uh, communications, and external affairs efforts, she has been lobbying Congress to pass current legislation which would establish a bipartisan congressional uh, commission to produce a feasible plan uh, for the museum, including its governance, organizational structure, fundraising, location, and operations. Joan has championed women's issues on and off Capitol Hill through her career as a registered lobbyist. She has worked with legislators um, and women's organizations to effect a positive change on a host of issues. Uh, Ms. Wages' uh, legislative accomplishments include passage of the Family and Medical uh, Leave Act, as well as a smoking ban on aircraft, numerous aviation security measures, and Delaware legislation to prevent the takeover of corporations by corporate raiders. Uh, Ms. Wages holds a BA from Auburn University and an MA in philosophy from uh, Columbia Pacific University. She currently resides in Alexandria, Virginia, so please welcome to our Wages. Thank you, Brian. It's always such a delight to, hear, to be here. Um, we always use GFWC as an example of the power of women and uh, love to talk about all of the... Oh, dear. Okay, we're, we're just... Let's stay right here. It's always um, a test to, to drive one of these things. So, um, Anyway, it's a pleasure to be here, and of course, Women's History Month is uh, the month that we love to shine, but we, we want there to come a day where we shine a light on women's history every day of the year. So, um, what we want to talk about today is an exhibit that we have online that's called First But Not Last, Women Who Ran for President. So, as all of us know, We've had 44 Americans who have served as president of our great nation. 43 were white men, and none of them have been women. Um, we would like to think of ourselves as being a very progressive country, and we would like to think of ourselves as being the first and the best, but that's not always the case. Um, compared with other democracies, the United States, in fact, has been slow to recognize the abilities of the majority of its citizens. Although we as Americans like to think of ourselves as leading the way, the fact is, is that 26 countries granted women the vote before the US did, and the same is true of electing women as national leaders. In fact, uh oh Brian, you're right between me and the uh, <laughs> There we go. In, in, in fact, um, these countries, um, many of which are, are not um, huge countries, have already elected women as president. And these nations have elected women as prime minister. In addition to these, there is the Chancellor of Germany, and uh, currently, Angela Merkel, and she is one of the world's most powerful and respected political leaders. It is not as though American women haven't tried. Mm -hmm. NWHM re research shows that at least 35 women have run for president. Most are unknown, and some represented parties that arguably merit obscurity. <laughs> such as the surprise party <laughs> and the looking back party. 
While some may generate amusement, it nonetheless is true that the women who mounted platforms to speak to their issues were very courageous. And that's an understatement. They knew that their audacity invited ridicule, but as more and more accepted the risk, their candidates elevated their candidacies elevated the public's esteem for women's abilities. First but not the last, women who ran for president is one of our nearly 24 online exhibits. It highlights the campaigns of only 12 of the 35 women who pursued America's top office, each of whom left a stepping stone for the one who would follow. While time won't permit us going through all of them, and their campaigns, I would like to tell you a bit about each of these 12 and in doing so demonstrate the progress as that they made over time. That progress is clear, as I think each of us knows what once seemed impossible is now very, very possible. It began with Victoria Clafton Woodhall the first woman to declare herself as a candidate for president. Victoria announced her run on April the 2nd, 1870, by sending a notice to the New York Herald. Now, let's take a second thought at that. 1870, that's uh, 50 years before we actually got the vote. This was an absolutely astounding thing to do. Furthermore, she announced her candidacy without contacting any of the leading suffragists, who by then had been well organized for more than two decades. Susan B. Anthony and others were stunned by this action of this controversial woman whose open marriage was the talk of New York City. <laughs> Again, let's remember, 1870. The election was nearly two years away, and Woodall used the time to bring attention to women's issues, including the right to vote. Undaunted by the fact that women could not vote, and that she was not even old enough to hold the presidency, <laughs> Victoria traveled the country campaigning. Her speeches not only advocated for the vote, but also birth control, free love, and other positions that were a century ahead of their time. Not, <laughs> Not surprisingly, Woodall and her sister, Tenny, were in jail <laughs> by the time the 1872 presidential election occurred. Wanting to draw attention to the era's hypocrisy on sexual matters, Woodall's and her, and her sister's weekly magazine uh, published the facts about an adulterous affair between a nationally popular reverend, Henry Ward Beecher, and a leader of the women's movement, Elizabeth Tilton. It was true, but not politically correct. <laughs> and the sisters were indicted for both libel and obscenity. The charges were eventually dropped, but the scandal was enough to end Woodall's presidential aspirations, and she spent election day in jail. <laughs> Good for her. Um, next came Belva Lockwood, a self-made woman who adopted bold positions in support of equal opportunity for women. She was a lawyer, pacifist, and feminist. She herself became the first woman lawyer to practice before the Supreme Court. She founded the National Equal Rights Party and was its candidate for president in 1884 and 1888. Susan B. Anthony and others felt that Lockwood's decision to run was self-serving and distracting from the greater mission but Lockwood saw it as a way to bring attention to women as genuine citizens. The party's platform wasn't just limited to feminism. It included positions on foreign affairs, 
civil service reform, and other issues, including an innovative proposal for the federalization of family law. The Lockwood ticket won just over 4,000 votes in six states, but Lockwood was not discouraged in 1984 and ran again in 88. It was then 76 years before another woman stepped forward for the bid. Margaret Chase Smith served 32 years in Congress and was the first woman elected in both the House and the Senate. Although a champion for women's issues, she was always clear that she wanted to be seen as a U.S. Senator and not a woman Senator. In 1964, she became the first credible female candidate for president. Unlike her predecessors, predecessors she did have legislative experience. She was a liberal Republican who was closely associated with her native state, Maine, and, but she moved to Washington when her husband, Clyde Smith, was elected to the House in 1936. When he died in 1940, Margaret won the special election, and then three months later, she ran for a full term and won. Smith moved up to the Senate in 1948, and in that election, she defeated Maine's then current governor and a former governor. Her 1960 re-election was a milestone for women as it was the first time that two women were nominated for a U.S. Senate seat. Smith easily defeated the Democratic nominee during that election and by 1964 she was nationally respected and she ran for president. She won the votes of 27 delegates at the Republican National Convention that nominated the more conservative Barry Goldwater. She was 66 at the time, and sadly, ageism joined sexism as a factor in her loss. Rather than crediting her experience and many accomplishments, pundits speculated about whether Senator Smith was menopausal. Oh. <laughs> her point. I haven't seen the age played up in the case of men candidates. Um, but her point was made in vain, and she did lose the election, uh, the, the nomination. Um, she did remain in the Senate until 1972. Following her was Patsy Ta Takimoto Meek. Uh, she was the first woman of color to serve in the United States Congress. But it was the work that she did there that should be remembered. She worked tirelessly to serve women, minorities, and the poor, and in essence brought attention to issues that others ignored. Her family was put under surveillance after the attacks on Pearl Harbor, and her father was taken from their home for interrogation. Like most Hawaiians of Japanese descent, the Takimotos were not sent to an internment camp, but they were aware that most man, mainland Japanese Americans were incarcerated, and that was an important factor in Patsy's development. She graduated from the University of Chicago Law School in 1951, but no Chicago law firm would hire her. And instead, she and her husband moved to Hawaii, which was only a territory at the time. She opened a law practice, thereby becoming the first female Japanese-American lawyer in Hawaii. She was active in the territory's Democratic Party. She founded the Young Democrats of America, which led to her election in the Territorial House of Representatives in 1956 and then the Hawaii Senate in 1958, and then she made her run for the U.S. House when Hawaii became a state in 1959. Um, she lost that election the first time, but in 1964 she succeeded. In 1972, a group of liberal Democrats in Oregon asked me to become their presidential candidate, and she was placed on the ballot in Oregon's May primary. 
she received 2% of the votes, coming in eighth of nine candidates. But nevertheless, she had achieved her objective of getting Americans to consider the possibility of a female president. Shirley Chisholm was attending Brooklyn College when a blind political science professor, impressed with her quick mind and debating skills, encouraged her to consider politics. She reminded him that she had a double handicap. She was black and a woman. She ended up being elected to the state assembly in 1964, and in 1968, she ran for a seat in the U.S. Congress. Chisholm won the seat with her independent spirit and her campaign slogan, unbought and unbossed. <laughs> the win made her the first African-American woman in Congress. During her second term in the House, Chisholm ran for the presidency. While she was, in fact, the first well-known black woman to run for president, that wasn't what she wanted people to focus on during her campaign. The fact that her campaign was seen primarily as symbolic by so many truly hurt her. She didn't run because she wanted to be first, rather she ran because she wanted to be seen as a real, viable candidate. Overall, people in 14 states voted for Chisholm. After six months of campaigning, she had 28 delegates who were committed to vote for her in the 1972 Democratic Convention. That convention was the first in which an African-American woman was considered for the presidential nomination. Although she didn't win, she received 151 of the delegates' votes. Next was New York resident Ellen McCormick. Most of you have probably never heard of her. She was a mother of four who became involved in politics because of her passion against abortion. In fact, her campaign centered on that issue in both 1976 and 1980 presidential bids. McCormick termed herself a housewife and grandmother during her campaigns. Unlike Congresswomen Margaret Chase Smith, Patsy Mink, and Shirley Chisholm, McCormick didn't have prior government experience or a platform beyond issues related to life. Because of then recent changes in federal election law, though, McCormick became the first female presidential candidate to qualify for federal campaign funds. The matching funds boosted her candidacy, allowing her to run television ads and to become fairly visible nationally. She also was the first female candidate to receive Secret Service coverage. McCormick appeared on the ballot in at least 18 states, more than any other woman before her. While she didn't win any primaries, her vote total of 238,000 plus was higher than that of some well-known Democratic men. She had 22 delegates at the Democratic National Convention that nominated Jimmy Carter. Sonia Johnson was a fifth generation Mormon who entered the political sphere when the Mormon church spoke out against the Equal Rights Amendment. An English professor and mother of four, she knew very little until she became uneasy that her church was, quote, opposing something with a name as beautiful as the Equal Rights Amendment. This eventually led Johnson to run for the presidency. The ERA opponents successfully stalled the bill and Congress had cooperated with feminists by extending the deadline to get ratification for the ERA until 1982. With little support, the second deadline passed and 
um, with no more ratifications, and it was this that motivated Johnson to run in 1984 for the presidential campaign. She was nominated by two minor parties, the U.S. Citizens Party and the Peace and Freedom Party. She was the first third party candidate to qualify for primary matching funds. And most feminists in 1984 saw Sonia Johnson as akin to Belva Lockwood back in 1884. They thought her race was unrealistic and excessively personal. Instead, they supported former Vice President Walter Mondale, who lost to incumbent Ronald Reagan. Although Colorado first elected women to its legislature in 1894, it was not until 1972 that Patricia Schroeder became its first congresswoman. Her quarter century career in Congress made her the all-time leader on women's issues, and her campaign for the 1988 presidential election was rooted in her belief that America is man enough to back a woman. <laughs> she graduated from Harvard Law School in 1964, just one of 19 women among the more than 500 men. Schroeder later described this as the best preparation for the infiltrating of the old boys club. <coughs> At just 32, she upset the incumbent and narrowly won an election to her House seat. It was her opposition to the Vietnam War uh, that was key to her victory, and she worked to become the first woman on the House. Um, on the, she was the first woman on the House Armed Services Committee. She used her position to press issues related to women including the first entrance of women into military academies, hearings on sexual harassment in the military, and the passage of other acts to protect the wives and children of military men. As co-founder of the Bipartisan Congressional Caucus for Women's Issues and as Democratic Whip, Schroeder became the lead sponsor of the Equal Rights Amendment as well as other legislation to secure women's rights in employment, education, and finance. Schroeder thus found firm support among feminists when she launched her 1988 presidential campaign, but not enough to win the Democratic nomination that went to Michael Dukakis. <coughs> to be clear, she became closer than any woman thus far coming in third in a June 1987 Time Magazine poll, and now National Organization of Women pledged $400,000 to her campaign, which is enough for her to qualify for federal matching funds, and Schroeder visited 29 states during her 1987 campaign. But she was ever practical, and her motto from the beginning was, no dough, no go. <laughs> and when she could not raise sufficient money to compete against the better funded men, she ended her campaign that autumn. Her strong sense of humor was re reflected in her response to inquiries about running as a woman. She said, what choice do I have? <laughs> <laughs> Lenora Fulani was um, an outspoken uh, spokesperson for the New Alliance Party, which um, had come together in New York, um, and she became its candidate for the presidency in 1988 and 1992. Um, she had run as a nominee for, um, she had run as a can its candidate for lieutenant governor, for mayor of New York City, and the following year uh, was Knapp's candidate for governor. Uh, these failed races made no difference to her as she ran for president, declaring a militant crusade for fair elections and democracy, 
with the goal of changing the electoral process. Uh, with a, she was uh, a third party candidate and with a base in neither camp, Republican nor Democratic, uh, Fulani nonetheless became the first woman and the first African American to appear on the ballot in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. So Elizabeth Dole was voted most likely to succeed in her high school class, and they were very astute. Uh, she was the first woman to serve in two different cabinet positions under two presidents. She ran for the Republican nomination in the presidential election in 2000. She graduated from law school um, at the encouragement of Margaret Chase Smith. And she joined Richard Nixon's administration as an assistant in the Consumer Affairs Department. And then he appointed her to the Federal Trade Commission. Um, she then wed Kansas Senator Robert Dole in 1975. And um, but when the Democrats won the White House in 1976, Elizabeth Dole was out of office until 1983. But um, it was, and then when she went back into the Ronald Reagan administration, she became the Secretary of Transportation. And the department was less than 20 years old at the time, and she was the first woman to be its head. When Vice President George H.W. Bush became president in 1989, he swore in Dole as the nation's 20th Secretary of Labor. And uh, she left the Bush cabinet in 1991 to head the American Red Cross. Dole was the first woman in that role since founder Clara Barton had retired in 1904. Um, she took a leave of absence in 1999 when she sought the uh, Republican presidential nomination in her own right um, after having worked on her husband's um, presidential campaign, and early polls showed her second only to George W. Bush. Uh, Elizabeth Dole raised more money than any previous presidential candidate, female presidential candidate, but discovered the same phenomena that hurt well-qualified women <coughs> who preceded her. Donors do not give as freely to women as to men. She withdrew after a seven-month effort when she had raised only $4.7 million compared to Bush's $57 million. Carol Mosley Vaughn was elected to the Senate in 1992, and she was um, elected in what was considered to be the Year of the Woman in the aftermath of the Clarence Thomas Anita Hill proceedings. Bronze win made her the first African-American woman elected to the U.S. Senate, the first African-American senator to be elected as a Democrat, and the first woman elected to the Senate from Illinois. Uh, she graduated from the University of Chicago with a law degree and joined the Justice Department. Three years later, she was elected to the Illinois House, and in 1991, she ran for the Senate in Illinois. Uh, she announced her presidency candidate, herself as a candidate for, for the presidency at Howard University in 2003 uh, while acknowledging that it was a bit of a long shot. She did not think that that meant that she couldn't win. <laughs> Mosley Braun argued that her experience in local, state, and national and international government made her a well-rounded candidate. Uh, when television journalist Diane Sawyer asked why she didn't support another candidate who had a real shot at victory, Mosley Braun replied that her record was as strong as that of some male candidates. John Edwards had only stood for election once, and Howard Dean had um, only stood for election once. And Al Sharpton had never held an elective office. So she was every bit as qualified as these three men. 
But like other female candidates, Mosley Braun found it difficult to raise money, and her well-publicized effort to get on the Virginia ballot by petition did not collect enough signatures. So she removed herself from the campaign um, in an announcement in 2004 on the John Stewart Daily Show. And then we get to Hillary Rodham Clinton, the first first lady elected to the U.S. Senate and the first female senator from New York. Um, she campaigned to be the first woman nominated by a majority party for president. So running on the Democratic ticket, uh, she worked hard to ensure that the press and the American people didn't see her simply as the wife of the former president, Bill Clinton but as a senator who had contributed much in her own right. With the possible exception of Eleanor Roosevelt, Clinton traveled more than previous first ladies. She often took her daughter along with her when she visited women in Africa and Asia. In 1995, she joined the American delegation that went to Beijing for the United Nations Conference on Women's Rights. This convocation has been held every five years since 1975, but no First Lady before or since has attended it. As her husband's second term ended, she ran in 2000 for the New York Senate seat, being vacated by Daniel Moynihan. Many accused her of being a carpetbagger because she had never lived in New York, but voters chose her by a solid 55% majority and Clinton easily won her 2006 re-election. On January 20th, 2007, the anniversary of her husband's 1992 inauguration, Clinton announced that she was running for president, proclaiming, I'm in and I'm in to win. The 2008 race already was a historic milestone as her chief rival for the Democratic nomination was Barack Obama, an African American. On June 7, 2008, Hillary Clinton ended her historic march to the White House after her primary opponent, Barack Obama, reached the necessary number of Democratic delegates to claim victory. She had received more than 18 million votes arguably the largest number of any primary candidate in history. She described it as 18 million cracks in the glass ceiling. Undeniably, she broke the cash ceiling for women by raising more than $212 million. Fundraising, as we have seen, has always been the biggest impediment for women candidates. Clinton's 18-month campaign clearly shattered old perceptions that a woman cannot succeed in running for our nation's highest office. She came very close to winning the Democratic nomination. And now, 2015, little more than a year from the next presidential election, Hillary seems to be a given. Perhaps, or it seems as a, as a given, and perhaps Elizabeth Warren, but who knows? Um, what we do know is that because of Victoria Woodhull and all those I've mentioned, and a few I haven't, one, what once seemed impossible is now truly possible. And as Susan B. Anthony stated in her last public speech over 100 years ago, failure is impossible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joan, and again, thank you to Teresa for joining us today for our Women's History Month celebration. I would also be remiss if I did not thank one more group of ladies that helped out with today's event, my special assistant, Tricia Wagman, who's probably back in the dining room as we speak, and all of the assistants who are preparing our lovely reception today. So. Please enjoy the Girl Scout cookies and all of the, there's Miss Tricia, thank you, 
and all of the other wonderful things that they have um, for us. And Brian, do you have a presentation? Yes, we just wanted okay. to thank our speakers with these two gifts right here. So. <laughs> we have little gifts of appreciation for you coming today, so thank you so much. We should say Margaret Chase Smith was a club woman. Thank you, Brian. If you hadn't said that, I was going to. So. <laughs> Got a plug for a GFWC fellow club woman. And um, thank you all for coming out today, and please enjoy the reception. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.